Different forms of Christianity allow for the acceptance of varying degrees of scientific knowledge, and all forms say that their view of science is the most biblically sound. You've probably heard statements like these a time or two. Oh, well of course I accept the Big Bang Theory. The Bible says that God spoke the universe into existence, and it looks like that's how the universe started. It doesn't conflict with my faith at all. Science and scripture are totally compatible. Yeah, I definitely believe in evolution. There's strong evidence for it. Who's to say God didn't just guide evolution to create us that way? It doesn't conflict with my faith at all. I like science. I just don't like so-called scientists that peddle bogus theories or are gullible enough to accept them themselves. Real scientists know that creation is the most scientifically accurate theory, so real science doesn't conflict with my faith at all. But what happens if you ditch the caveats and accept well-supported scientific findings entirely? If you're a Christian, what would that mean for your theological views? Well, luckily, I'm here to spell that out for you one issue at a time and teach you how to fit Christianity with science. The Big Bang The Big Bang was a cosmic event where 13.8 billion years ago, space-time expanded from a single point of essentially infinite density called the Singularity into a less dense, ever-expanding universe. This was the beginning of our universe as we know it. So right off the bat, we've got a conflict with the age of the universe as demonstrated in a literal reading of the Old Testament. Genealogies in the Bible date the creation week back to around 6,000 years ago. But not to worry, we have a few ways to fit this with Christianity. As my friend Alex from Cosmic Skeptic once said, Don't think that just because you believe that the Big Bang happened means that you can't believe in God. Many people believe that the Big Bang did happen and it was God who banged it. You could accept that God created the universe 13.8 billion years ago and believe that he still created our world around 6,000 years ago and that some of the creation story is myth or metaphorical. Maybe the days of creation just represented long periods of time in which the universe formed. We could also say that we just don't know when man was created, but the creation story and genealogies were obviously some kind of metaphor. Solar nebular theory. This encompasses quite a bit, but essentially it describes how our solar system formed from nebular material about 4.6 billion years ago. So again, we've got a discrepancy in the age of creation. This theory has Earth forming about 4.5 billion years ago, while the literal creation story says Earth was formed about 0.000006 billion years ago, or 6,000 years ago. But metaphorical interpretation already covers this, right? Well, it gets more complicated with this. The order of creation of celestial bodies in Genesis 1 doesn't match the order in which they formed as determined by science. Science tells us that the stars came first, and then the sun, then Earth, and other planets in our solar system. Genesis 1, on the other hand, says that an empty Earth came first, then light which determines day and night, then the seas and sky, then land and vegetation, and then the stars, the sun, and the moon. So it's obvious that the creation days can't just represent longer periods of time and still mesh with science. I mean, not only does the biblical creation of the heavens happen out of order, but it also says that day and night came before the sun, and we know that the sun's light is what illuminates the day. Genesis also says that plants came before the sun. It doesn't matter how long, any time away from the heat that the sun provides would kill plants right away. Even one day of separation between the two events would be far too long. So at least the first four days in the creation story can't be in order, so that eliminates the possibility that day in Genesis 1 just means a long period of time. Still though, you can say that creation is just some kind of metaphor. What the metaphor means is definitely hazier at this point, but you can still hold on to it for now. After all, there's still so much more to creation. Biological evolution. Evolution is change in the heritable characteristics of biological populations over successive generations. Basically, the theory of evolution explains how biological organisms change over time, ultimately from organisms which existed long ago into the organisms we see today. The theory pretty well explains how humans developed, that being from an ape-like ancestor from Northeast Africa over a period of several million years. Yet again, we're faced with something that conflicts with the literal creation story. For life to exist in its current state according to the theory of evolution, things must have been evolving for quite a bit longer than 6,000 years. The bigger issues, though, have more to do with the human side of the creation story. To understand those, we need to take a look into human evolution. Luckily, I know a guy who knows a good bit about evolution and is willing to help us out. Aaron, could you explain to me when the first humans evolved? Well, that depends on what you call a human. Uh, most people would consider only Homo sapiens sapiens. And that would be roughly, let's say, 
well, if you're talking about anatomical human or whether you're talking about, you know, culturally human, culturally human, I think we're somewhere in the range of uh, anything from 80,000 to 150,000 years ago, anatomically modern humans, I think have been uh, found as old as 300,000 years or thereabouts. Of course, when you talk about when anything evolved, you know, so you're like looking for when was the first human, a lot of people get confused about that because there's a there's a gradation scale like that you can look up online that runs between you know blue and red and it's just a continuous color pattern and you have to go to every little increment that you can think of exactly where does blue become red you know and it's much like the same thing with with the evolution of people i mean there, you could watch every generation for the last half a million years and you would never be able to identify the first human there would there'd be no way to tell you know, you could get within a range of, you know, several dozen generations or so, you know, these were the first people, but you could never identify the first person. That That's impossible. Okay, well, did humans at least evolve in one place? Again, it depends on how you define people. As I said, most people will, will go with only Homo sapiens sapiens, in which case uh, I think that the oldest artifacts are either in Southern Africa or they're in Morocco, but still on the African continent. So these are the oldest you know, uh, uh, anatomically modern human beings. We also have uh, Homo heidelbergensis and Homo erectus. Now, these are these are in the genus Homo, so they're still human. They're just not Homo sapiens sapiens human. And some people will distinguish Homo sapiens sapiens from Homo sapiens neanderthalensis, you know, as if, you know, different species. I'm not trying to argue whether they are distinctly different species or very nearly that. You know, that's kind of beyond the point right now. You know, Homo sapiens neanderthalensis or Neanderthals, would not be what most people would recognize as as Homo sapiens. They wouldn't. We wouldn't call them human, probably by any stretch. Uh, there's there's some new finds or some new realizations on uh, the, the the physicality of uh, Neanderthals. If there are their eyes, for example, are significantly larger uh, than our eyes. I mean, they would be immediately recognizably distinct. Now, their origin. And our origin came from a common source, let's say Homo heidelbergensis, right? And this would have been up just outside of Africa. So the origin for both of our species was not in Africa, but then their ancestors actually were from Africa, but then their, their ancestors were from Europe. So it depends on which generation species we're talking about. So the ancestor of all apes actually began in Europe, but then the ancestors of the great apes I think also began in Europe, and then the ancestors of all of the, the various types of human right down through uh, Australopithecines all began in Africa and then spread everywhere else. So we had uh, Homo erectus, for example, were all over the place. There were populations of Homo erectus that, that spanned the, the, the entirety of Eurasia as well as Africa. Okay, lastly, what's the latest date that we know modern humans existed by? Well, I know that there are archaeological finds in Africa for abstract works of art. And these were, these were dated, if I remember correctly, around 78,000 years ago. However, there are also artifacts that match those in Northern Africa that were also uh, excavated in India. So we had people making arrowheads and spearheads and such of the same type that are already off the, the African continent. They're already in the Indian subcontinent, so to speak. So how much further did could they have gotten? If we, if we go to the, the latest possible date, then we've got almost two different origins at the same time. It's like they would have appeared in Africa and then immediately sent somebody over to India. So we know that there have to be artifacts that tie them together that are older than this. But roughly so between 74, 78,000 years, I think, is the oldest for modern artifacts. Thanks, Aaron. Given all this information, the decided metaphor in Genesis 1 becomes even hazier. With humans evolving in countless places, it's apparent that no literal Eden existed for the supposed first humans, women were not created after or from men, there was no time where death didn't exist, and there was probably no single act which triggered the fall of mankind. This necessitates that the view of original sin and its origin change. The fact that there were no first humans, though, might have even larger implications. God never said he judged soulless animals, but he does judge those with souls. We know that humans came from simpler, probably soulless animals, so who were the first humans with souls? Biologically, there were no first humans, so the first single person, couple, group, or generation given souls would have been picked arbitrarily. Here's the scenario we have to consider with this. God decides to give eternal souls to two people, like Adam and Eve. Other people exist, but are not given souls. Adam and Eve get a chance at heaven, but others don't. 
they have the same mental capacity as Adam and Eve, but they're not eternal. So that means God decided to remove them from existence when they die, despite their similarities with Adam and Eve. Evolutionary change is so gradual, the same would apply to thousands of generations prior to Adam and Eve. So did God just decide not to give so many humans any chance at heaven? Finally, modern humans have existed for tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of years, like Arne said. Meanwhile, the earliest forms of writing were invented only five or six thousand years ago. That means that any inspired word of God for early humans to follow for salvation could have only been preserved through oral tradition for the vast majority of human history. They had no written doctrine, no documented creed, nothing but the word of other humans to go by. But still, the Bible doesn't indicate that they were held to a different standard than the people who had God's word in writing. So how do we reconcile Christianity with our understanding of these serious implications? Well, at the very least, the whole creation story, the fall of man and original sin, must be entirely non-literal. You could take it as a metaphor again, as well as accept that God let some humans exist without souls, and some with less of a chance of finding salvation in his words than you have. But for the sake of honesty, with the impact of these implications, we need to ask some bigger questions. Since the theories we've accepted here explain so much about our universe and its natural development, where exactly does God come into play? Science explains the beginning of the universe, its development into its current form, how life develops from simple forms into complex beings like us, and so on. If all those things can happen naturally as we've observed them, why is God needed for our world to exist as it does? Hasn't every cause for every effect we've ever seen been naturalistic? Mankind used to think that Earth could only exist because God made it. We thought that we could only exist by God's creation. We thought he directly influenced seasons, the weather, the tides, the sun, the stars, and much, much more. But now we know those things behave according to natural forces, which science easily explains. Still, this could be accounted for in a Christian worldview in one way. We don't know how everything came to be, and we don't know why certain processes we can only describe act the way they do. So you could assert that this is where God resides. If you don't know how it happened or how it works, God did it. The main issue here ends up being that humanity has said that before and later found the explanation to be naturalistic. Plus, we can readily and reliably observe naturalistic causes all the time, but can't say the same for supernatural ones. So a naturalistic explanation stands as a possibility for many, if not all, unknowns. You could remain firm believing in the necessity of God, but the plausibility of that belief remains undemonstrated. Finally, let's put a cap on our discussion of biblical metaphor. In the end, it's apparent that the biblical concepts we discussed are, at the very least, metaphorical. Of course, they could still teach valuable lessons without being literal. However, how at that point can we tell those lessons come from God? Other holy texts contain stories, both literal and fictional, which teach valuable lessons. What makes only Christianity's teaching metaphors definitively divinely inspired? Even then, how do we know those passages were intended to be interpreted metaphorically and aren't just falsehoods meant to be taken literally? It is possible to fit Christianity and an acceptance of science together, as long as you're willing to shrink God into tiny, ever-receding gaps in scientific knowledge. Then you must advocate the likelihood of supernatural explanations which have not yet been shown even plausible. Finally, you must perceive the biblical text as divinely inspired metaphor, while perceiving all other potentially metaphorical holy texts as natural in origin. Hebrews 11.1 1 precisely describes the kind of faith necessary to believe these things, because the definitive truth of Christian doctrine can only be hoped for, as any evidence for it is always unseen. Thank you for watching. I've been Drew, or Genetically Modified Skeptic. Thank you, Arn, so much for your contribution. You've really helped me out here. Thanks to my personal sponsor, Rob, and of course, to my personal Lord and Savior, Adam, for making this video possible. As of the posting of this video, I'm officially a full-time YouTuber. To help me keep it up, subscribe, check out my Patreon, follow me on Twitter at GMSkeptic, say a prayer of thanks to Adam, and until next time, stay skeptical.